look at uh, Peter and Luke chapter two, or John chapter 21. And what happens in this experience is, is Peter is going back fishing. And I think as we begin to uh, declutter our lives that sometimes we realize that we've got a bunch of junk in our boat. Right? Peter had a bunch of stuff in his boat. And as I, you know, we were decluttering it in the house and things like that, and I'm sure you guys uh, came across some old picture albums and things like that. I mean, I've, I've gone through, uh, I found uh, an old tape of me preaching from 2008. I probably should destroy this afterwards because it's probably real bad, you know. I found my diploma from Christ for the Nations, which is actually falling apart a little bit, but it's there. Uh, I did go to Bible school, if anybody needs proof. Um, uh, you know, I found my old baseball glove and things like that. And sometimes I think what happens is, is in the middle of this decluttering process, we realize that we have filled our lives with a bunch of junk that we need to get rid of. A bunch of stuff that maybe underneath, buried deep into this, is a memory that we had with Jesus Christ. Maybe somewhere underneath of all that clutter is, is, is a calling that Jesus called us to. And we need to remember what God has done, and from there as we declutter, that Lord will show us who we are, what He has called us to, and why we're here in the first place. Amen? You're going to have to get past my legs this morning. I asked Becca if I should wear pants or not, and she said, well, I mean, wear shorts, pants, you know what I mean? Uh, She said, if you're going to do this, go all the way in, all right? We're going to go all the way in. I think that maybe then possibly you've put your calling or God's word to you perhaps on a shelf. Maybe you've cluttered it over with dust and dirt and some other things that you've put in priority over God's priority. And I think this morning it's time to declutter, to uncover the word of God spoke to you and to start doing what God called you to do. So let's take this as a restoration, I think, of God's word to you. This is the thing about what Jesus speaks to us is is that it is an eternal word that lasts forever. It's unchanging. And what Jesus said to you before, I believe he's saying to you again this Sunday morning. Last week I talked about the kingdom of God and how when the kingdom of God comes, it reorders our lives. That we have other priorities that we may have put over top of them. But this morning, I think that we're going to uncover what God has done. This past week, I listened to Pastor John Kilpatrick as he was speaking about a word for 2018. And he said this. He said that this is going to be a year where God breaks in and imposes his will over other people's will. He said that this is going to be a year where God overrules what other people have been saying. And he called it a divine interruption. That God is going to interrupt your life and the way you think it's going to go. And he's going to change everything. The question I want to ask you this morning is, is are you ready to be divinely interrupted? Now I'm going to read a substantial portion of scripture in John chapter 21. If you could open up your Bibles. John chapter 21 verses 1 through 14. Now, it is a large portion of Scripture, so stick with me. It's a narrative. Like I tell my hair every morning when I look in the mirror, stick with me, okay? It says this in John chapter 21. It says, after these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples. This is the third time that Jesus has shown himself after the resurrection at the Sea of Tiberias, which is also called, we know it as the Sea of Galilee. And he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus. Then Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will come with you also. And they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, and yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? And they answered him, no. And he said He said to them, cast your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and when they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Verse 7, therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved, who is John, by the way, telling the story, said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, he was stripped for work, and uh, threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat 
for they were not far from land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out onto the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and the bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. I like this part because Jesus is like, this is my fish on the fire. You get your own, all right? Bring it here. You can cook your own. Verse 11, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him. Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. And Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them. Does that sound familiar to you? And the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus had manifested himself to the disciples. He was raised from the dead. You know, it never fails in the myriad of times that I've been fishing uh, that you get back to the dock, you're ready to load your boat and go home and everything, that there is some always man, it seems like, standing there, usually a little bit, a little bit older, a little gray in his hair, and he's looking over the dock and he's saying, hey, how did you do? Did you catch any fish? And now that question is wonderful when you caught a bunch of fish. However, that's a horrible question when you got skunked that day and you didn't catch anything. And, of course, you have to answer him somehow. Usually I like to mumble a little bit. No, I didn't catch anything, you know. What'd you say? I didn't catch anything. Don't worry about it, you know. You're going to catch my fist if you keep it up, right? (laughs) Now, some fishermen get real inventive and they'll say, well, we caught the sunset or something like that. Either way, I think what happens is is that as people ask over and over again, this is what Peter is experiencing. They're out on the boat. They've caught nothing. You would fish at night on the Sea of Galilee when the fish would run. And so they caught nothing. And that morning, then they see Jesus. He's got a little campfire out on the boat or out, out from the boat on shore. And then Peter answers back that he hasn't caught anything. People, Peter and the disciples are worn out. They've been up all night. Somebody on shore is telling them how to catch fish. Did you catch anything? I mean, some, eventually that conversation with that older man sitting on the dock is going to tell you how he caught fish when he was younger and how he caught fish, you know, uh, back in the day and what bait you need to use and what tide you need to fish on. Either way, that's what's happening in this scenario. And all of a sudden, he casts his net like the man instructed on shore on the right side of the boat. How in the world couldn't Peter remember this situation? He's experienced this once before with Jesus when he had caught nothing all night long. And then Jesus is telling him again, let down your net where I tell you to let down your net and then you'll catch something. It had to have been deja vu for him. Let me set up the entire scene for you. It's a familiar one. Jesus said to the, I mean, Peter said to the disciples, I'm going to go fishing. He didn't mean that he was going fishing for souls, which I think is really the problem. He meant that he was going fishing for fish. I know a pastor in Florida that calls his boat Never on Sunday, which is a pretty good name. Uh, I've heard that in town there was a pastor, right, that had a boat called the Visitation or something like that. So when the secretary would say, where's the pastor? And then they could say, well, he's on visitation. And he could not be lying that it actually was on his boat. It's a great idea. Um, I think there's a lot of creativity here, and I love that idea. There's certainly times that I would like to post on my office door, gone fishing. However, I wouldn't want to imply the fact that I was out on my boat fishing literally, but rather that I was somewhere in town fishing for souls. As much as I love fishing, there is something that's greater when a person comes to Jesus Christ for the first time. And I think Peter has lost the essence of what he should be doing. And Jesus is getting ready to recall him to that very task. So Peter and the disciples go fishing for fish. And that seems a little bit aimless. I'll withhold judgment that those disciples were all backslidden, had turned their back on Jesus at the time. However, I certainly think that that could be the case. However, I think the problem lies in the fact that Jesus told Peter once already in Luke chapter 5 when the first fishing miracle happened. He said, do not fear, Peter. From now on, you will be catching men and not fish. And then it says in verse 11, when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So that night while they're fishing, they caught nothing, which is a big problem when you are a commercial fisherman. 
See, I think that it boils down to this, that when you try to do things that are outside the will of God, that they will become nothing. All the culmination of your efforts will end in nothing. All the efforts of the disciples ended in nothing. However, when Peter listens and does the will of Jesus, then all of a sudden he's successful in what God had told him to do. And it reminds me, I think it would have been echoing through the disciples' minds at that moment. Jesus said to them, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So Peter lets down his nets on the other side of the boat, and Jesus called him the first time, the same exact way, he catches a great multitude of fish. Uh, Last year, the last week of September, we were privileged to be able to go uh, down to Florida and fish for five days with my brother, my dad, and uh, a man named Benji, so many of you know, Benji, and also Josh Harper, who's a lawyer for the Assemblies of God. We all convened down there in Florida, and we had a great time. But about midway through the week, my dad had gone to pick up my brother and Josh from uh, the airport, and it was just me and Ben on the boat. And while we were on the boat, it was hot. It was 90-some-odd degrees. We were tired. We had ran out of water that day, and uh, we were catching bait for the other guys to come on the boat to get ready for them to fish. And while we were there in the grass flats of Florida, uh, we're catching bait, we're chumming up the waters, and I think we're a little bit out of our minds, to tell you the truth. Uh, We started making up puns about chum and how you chum for fish, and if you chum, they will come, and we were chanting that as we're standing on the boat. We're singing songs like chum chumini, chum chumini, chum chum taru. And I mean, we're just literally, I think we were a little bit out of our minds, a little bit loopy. Uh, And in the midst of that, I remember I'm standing on the front of the boat, the chum line is going out beside me, and we're trying to catch bait. And I had my cast net, and I was casting over and over again for bait. And I'm like, this is futile, man. I'm I'm barely doing anything. I don't know what's going on. Ben's walking around the boat looking for bait fish. And all of a sudden, he says, Scott, come back here and cast your net in the back of the boat. Because if you cast your net in the back of the boat, I'm pretty sure that I saw some flashes of light as the fish had kind of tilted on their side, and it flashed from the light coming into the water. He says, I think there's fish back there. I'm not 100% sure, but I think there's fish back there. So I went back to the back of the boat and I, the first cast that I casted where Ben told me to cast I had caught as many fish as in the 20 throws on the front of the boat and I think what this is is, is what Peter is experiencing is what you have taken years to build in your own kingdom in your own way that in one single moment with Jesus Christ when you cast your net where Jesus has told you to cast it then everything comes to resolution. Everything comes uh, to fruition like he wanted in the first place. When you are obedient to Jesus to do the things not in your own way, in your own will, what took you years to accomplish in the flesh will take you moments to accomplish in obedience and in the presence of Jesus. I mean, I watch people all the time trying to build their lives, build their lives, accomplish something. And I think, man, if you would just stop and do what Jesus told you to do in the first place, you would be light years ahead of where you are right now. And so what happens is is they catch all these fish, and suddenly John recognizes the recalling of the disciples. He's like, this is familiar. I've been here before. I was on a boat, and Jesus called me once before. I know this is going to happen. I know what's going to happen in this scenario. Peter doesn't even recognize it. And John yells out, look, it's Jesus on the shore. They couldn't recognize him physically and his translate his body, his new body. Maybe he looked a little bit different. Maybe his voice didn't sound the same, his inflection of his voice. Whatever it was, it was different. They didn't recognize that it was Jesus. Maybe their eyes were veiled from the fact that it was Jesus. And John suddenly recognizes that it was him and says, look, it's Jesus on the shores. And so Peter puts on his outer garment and then he jumps into the water and goes after Jesus. You know what? Sometimes I think we need people like John to help us recognize the presence of God when we wouldn't otherwise recognize it. The truth is, is that God's presence is everywhere. If you believe that he is omnipresent in all places at all times, then you must know and you must realize that God is everywhere in the earth, in everybody's life in some form or fashion, calling them to himself. And all we need to do is recognize what God is doing in those places. 
I think we need people like John because we're often like Peter and we don't recognize that it's Jesus on the shores of our life. So I think we need to declutter, declutter our eyes, declutter our hearts and open ourselves up to waiting upon the Lord to see what he's going to do. So just like the first time Jesus had done the fishing miracle for Peter, he leaves everything and he follows after Jesus. Except this time, Peter doesn't even have time to bring the boat to shore. He jumps in the water and he jumps down into the shore with Jesus just to be in his presence. You know, I think God often rewards this kind of reckless abandon for him. I mean, to just not worry about anything else. Everything else becomes peripheral with Jesus, and you just seek after his presence. I remember an experience, another Florida experience. It was years ago before we had kids. Uh, We got into sailing catamarans. Many of you know that we were sailing beach cat catamarans, and uh, it was a blast. I owned well over a dozen of them at, at different times. And so we would often, Becca and I would go out sailing. We would step the mast of this little beach cat boat. It had two hauls, one on either side, about 16, 17 feet long, and then a netting between it. So it was a wet bottom boat. And we would sail. I mean, there's something awesome about the fact that there's no motor behind you but you're moving on the water going where you want to go and so we would do that pretty often and one particular scenario was is that i got into this boat building and and putting boat back back together and things like that and i wanted to build a overpowered catamaran the problem is is that catamarans are already overpowered in themselves and so what happened was is i put a 28 foot mast on a boat that should have had a 25 foot mast and so once i put a 25 foot mast or 20 eight foot mast on it i put uh, sails on it that were much larger in square feet i think it was somewhere 240 additional square feet of sail on the boat that was already overpowered and so what happened was is we put it in the water we sailed out of hurricane pass out into the open waters of the gulf of mexico and you know what we kept flipping the boat over and over and over again because it was overpowered i mean we were flying through the water it was awesome i thought it was the thrill of my life it was a blast to me But I don't think Becca really liked it, okay? Flipping the boat. I think we flipped it almost a half a dozen times that day. And so we were coming back in after we had flipped it the last time. And there we got kind of caught in the turbulent waters and the tides and the winds of Hurricane Pass, a small pass that you have to go through with other boats coming through. We hit a sandbar and we flipped the boat. The problem was is this time is is that Becca fell off the boat and she cut herself on one of the side stays that held the mast up, a large metal cable. And so in the midst of that, we get back, crawl back up onto the boat, and all of a sudden, when there's water and there's blood in the water, it's a scary thing. I had seen sharks all over that area before. You know, a thousand things are running through my mind. What in the world's going to happen? You know what I mean? We draw in sharks in, and then the hulls of the boat were white, and so all of a sudden you see the blood on the white hull, and you are freaking out. Some boaters came over, and thankfully they took Becca to shore uh, so that she could get helped, and they called 911. We didn't know what was going on. and uh, So I'm left there by myself on the hull of that boat, wondering what I do with the boat, and what do I do about my wife being uh, on shore, and I want to go to her. All I could think about was is I wanted to be with her. And so some other boaters came over and said, do you want to go to shore with be with your wife? So I said, yes. I didn't worry about the boat. I jumped on the bow of their boat, and they ran me into the shoreline. I jumped off and went to be with my wife the rest of the time. My boat floated about seven miles south, almost to Clearwater Beach. All that I cared about in that moment was is that I was with my wife. And this is what Peter is doing. He forgot the boat. He forgot forgot the fish. All that matters is that he was with Jesus. In the myriad of things in your life, all that really matters is, is that you have the presence of Jesus in your life. You can leave everything behind because you can know that he's going to take care of you if Jesus is first in your life. So my question is, is are you willing to forsake everything to follow after Jesus, to declutter your life and to make his kingdom the presence and his kingdom presence the primary goal of life? John and the other five disciples, they come to shore with the boat pulling the great catch of fish. But Jesus already on shore with a charcoal fire and has fish and bread on it. Commentators speak very clearly about the fact that this is the communion meal overtones. It actually uses the same exact wordage, which I think is a very significant issue. 
Jesus had bread and fish there, and he invites the disciples into this meal to eat with him and Peter. And then the same wording is used at the communion meal. As John says, Jesus came, and he took bread, and he gave it to them, and the fish likewise. Doesn't that sound a whole lot like communion? He took and he broke the bread and he gave it to them and then he took the wine afterwards and gave it to them. But after the Last Supper, remember, uh, communion Peter had and shared with Jesus in the upper room. After that supper, he denied Jesus three times. You remember that? However, after this communion meal on the beach, this will result in Peter's obedience. It becomes a completion of the restoration process that Jesus is doing to once again share the most important meal of all the Christian faith with Jesus again. Peter communes with Jesus at the table once more. And Peter is looking into the eyes of forgiveness as he sits across the table with Jesus, the charcoal fire there. So laying on the shore are these 153 fish. It's a very significant thing that the Bible would actually name how many fish would lay, be laying on. They caught 153 fish. I mean, in the translation of the scriptures and how they came to us, that's a very significant thing. Because if you can number a fact, then it's an actual memory that the disciples are having. We know that this happened because of this very thing. And so the streams, uh, 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 what, what happens is, is that there have been theologians since early as Jerome, actually, uh, uh, that tried to figure out why there was 153 fish and why the 153 were even mentioned. Jerome talks about Ezekiel 47 and how the, the streams of life come out of Jerusalem and flow all the way to the Red Sea, and it's teeming with life, he says. Um, there's another, uh, Augustine talked about how that uh, uh, there were... Um, uh, he multiplies the numbers 1 through 17 or adds them all together, and that equals 153. I have no idea what he was talking about, nor do I think it's even necessary to think about that. Jerome also tried to uh, tie the 153 to 153 different types of species of fish, meaning that all the kingdom of God, all the ethnicities of the world were open to the kingdom of God. The problem is with Jerome is is that there's 28,000 different species of fish, and they keep finding them all the time. All that doesn't matter is what I'm saying. What matters is is that there was a great number of fish. And in the midst of the restoration process of the disciples, and especially Peter, what he is saying is, is that when you submit yourself to Jesus, you will bring a great haul of souls to the kingdom of God. That's what matters. So we see this restoration process taking place. I think scholars agree all on one thing, that significance is the multitude of fish, showing us that when the disciples submit themselves to Jesus and are obedient, that they will bring in a great haul of fish. You know, this is the promise, I believe, of the Psalm 23 prayer. It says this, that he restores my soul. You know, there's nothing in this life that the enemy has stolen from you, that Satan has taken away from you, That God cannot restore. There's nothing in life in any way, any form, or any fashion that God cannot restore. There's a beautiful thought, in fact, that when I've gotten off track, when I've gone wrong direction, when I've gone backwards instead of going forward, when I've gone left instead of going right, that Jesus is waiting on the shores of my life to restore me. To send me back to where I need to be. This is why I think we need to declutter our lives. To dig down deep underneath all that junk, all that clay, all that garbage. And find the promise that God gave us when we were younger. To find the promise and the word that he gave us when we were uh, in an earlier time. So that we can uh, dig it out and remember what Jesus has said to us. Dust it off and remember what Jesus is doing. So one thing that stands out to me in the contrast to the first and the second calling of Peter is is that the first time Jesus was on the boat with Peter and he told him to cast his net on the other side, right? The second time Jesus is on the shore. I think this is an allusion to the fact that the first time I would be right with you in physical form so that we could catch fish together. But the second time, Peter is on the boat fishing by himself with the other disciples. And Jesus is saying, okay, now it's your turn. I'm going to be with you in my presence and with my spirit. 
But you and the disciples are going to go out on your own and do the ministry that I have given you. If the worship team could come. I had a man in my uh, class, the systematic theology class last week at the district. And this man uh, was probably in his early 40s, late 30s. And he was telling me a story after the class that uh, he, he told me that he had gone to Christ for the Nations and went to Bible school. And he was uh, uh, trying to complete that ministry call. But what he didn't tell me is until the end of the class is that uh, something had interrupted everything that God had called him to. And he said that while he was there after a year, nearly a year of being at Christ for the Nations in Bible school, getting ready and preparing to go into the ministry, his wife was called into the ministry. His wife left him in the middle of that experience at Bible school, took all five of his kids and went to a different state away from him, left him just dry. And so he went after her like any honorable man would. He went after her trying to restore the relationship. They reconciled at some point, but then she left him again and went back to her hometown and found a guy that she had taken up with in high school. Then he went back there and he tried to restore the relationship there and be with his children and love them and be near to them. And she left him again. Not just one person, but another and another and another. So finally he finds himself all the way back here in Kentucky. And while he's here, he's going to the ministry classes at the Kentucky School of Ministry. And as he's going to these ministry classes, he's standing firm upon the word that says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. You see, there's no expiration date on your calling. If God called you to something or he called you to salvation, he called you to a ministry work, he called you to a vocation, a job years ago, he's conjuring up, I say, he's re uh, 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 birthing that dream in your heart once again. And I believe like he does. That God, no matter if he had failed to actualize his calling before, God's word is still there waiting for him to be obedient, to be willing to do what God has called him to do. So Jesus is recreating the scene of not only Peter's first calling and the Last Supper, but he's also recreating the scene of Peter's failure when he denied Jesus. Three times Peter denied Jesus. Remember in John chapter 18, it says uh, uh, in verse 18, Now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold and they were warming themselves. And Peter there was also, and he was standing and warming himself near the charcoal fire. What's significant about this is that there are only two mentions in the New Testament about a charcoal fire ever being kindled. Once at the shores with Jesus in this story, and once all also at the betrayal of Jesus when Jesus is being tried unlawfully in the court of the Sanhedrin and Peter is standing outside in the courtyard warming himself near a charcoal fire and what is happening is Jesus is recalling Peter back to that place of denial and saying now it's time to fix it Peter and so Jesus asks Peter three times subsequent to this story he says Do you love me? And Peter says, I love you, Jesus. He asks him again, do you love me, Peter? And he says, I love you, Jesus. And the third time he says, instead of denying Jesus, he says, Jesus, I love you. This is essentially what happens with uh, Christian counselors. This is that. The counselee will sit in the Christian counselor's office and they'll rehash some of the most hurtful and uh, painful memories that are open wounds within their heart and in their lives. And then the Christian counselor in the midst of that story will say, will you invite Jesus into that experience so he can restore it, so he can heal it, so he can clean out all the infection and the pain and restore what has been taken, what has been cut deep within your heart. I think that's what Jesus is doing to us today. Jesus is calling us back. If he's spoken to you a word in the past, that word doesn't go away. Because God's word lasts forever. It's eternal. So this time on the beach, Peter doesn't fail. This time Peter tells Jesus that he loves him rather than denying him. 
And Jesus is recreating the scene so that it could be a scene marked with obedience and not failure. This morning, if you open up your heart and let Jesus heal those past words, those past memories, the resolution of opening up towards Jesus and what He can do to heal that wound, all those past sins, all those past experiences, He will restore you today. This past week, I introduced my children to uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. I mean, the old version, you know. And they watched that for the first time, and it's a great movie. I love the fact that the Oompa Loompas sing about how children are brats because of the parents. You know what I mean? I was like, man, those Oompa Loompas are dead on. You know what I mean? (laughs) And so uh, they loved it, man. You should have seen my kids go wild when they saw that Charlie found the golden ticket, you know, in the candy bar. It was an awesome experience with my kids. And so in the midst of that, I remember a story uh, uh, of where Willy Wonka brings in all those kids and their parents to this chocolate factory, and he takes them into the candy gardens. He opens up the door, and he says, everything's eatable. I mean edible. Everything is edible in this place. And so all the kids run out, and they go eat all the candy and the stuff. The, uh, the, the trees and the mushrooms are all eat- edible. And so in the midst of that, he, he turns around, and of course, there's a musical, and he starts singing Pure Imagination. Pure Imagination. You know what I think the Lord wants us to do is to take us back to that childlike spirit in our hearts where our imaginations were pure before Him. And He wants to purify our imaginations. Some of you today have used your imagination for impurity. And God wants to restore that back to you. He wants to restore back to you the innocence of being a child in your faith. He wants to restore back to you all that the enemy has tried to take away from you. And he wants to purify your imagination so he can do it for the will of God. He can use it for his will in Jesus Christ. Do you remember the story of Isaac in Genesis chapter 28? I think it's a powerful story. Isaac says that he retired and he went back and he went to begin to uncover the wells of his father. He was going to build wells. But he says, rather than just building a well that's a brand new thing and digging out a well that's a brand new thing, I'm going to go back to the well of my father Abraham and dig that out. Because it was that the Philistine enemies had covered up them with clutter and with garbage and junk. Rocks and dirt they had filled them in with. And so Isaac went back in opposition to what the enemy wanted and he began to dig out those wells and dig out the very thing that God had wanted in their lives. And so he goes and he takes that clutter and he begins to toss it out everywhere. All the clutter that had been damming up the springs of God's life. In life-giving spirit, he begins to unclutter everything that the enemy had put on top of their lives so that he could be pure and that he could be holy and righteous and do the will of God. So that within that context, there was the life-giving springs of Jesus Christ. So within his life, he could get rid of all the junk and deep and buried underneath that experience, he found Jesus. This is what God wants for you. He wants you to uncover the clutter and the clouding that's in your life. Unclutter the harm and the hurt and the pain that the enemy has put on top of the wells of the life-giving spirit that he's given to you. So that down deep, buried deep inside your soul, deep inside the experience that Peter had in the boat, he found Jesus in the calling that Peter had been called to.